When the poet Alfred Lord Tennyson wrote, Though nature, red in tooth and claw, he was in no doubt seeking to evoke savage images of predation. Although the very term predation may bring about images of a cheetah chasing down a gazelle or a diving bird of prey, these violent routes of capture are certainly not the only means by which one organism consumes another. Over half of all Earth's species sustain themselves by feeding on other living organisms. Some acts of consumption result in the death of the food source, such as this mouse that is about to be captured by a great gray owl. Others merely graze by eating the tissue and fluids of their food source. The conceptual thread that links these interactions is that they all result in the exploitation of one individual. An exploitation is a relationship in which individuals of one species benefit by feeding on and directly harming individuals of another species. In other words, it enhances the fitness of one individual while reducing the fitness of the exploited individual, hence our tendency to refer to these as plus-minus relationships. Most exploitative relationships fit into one of three broad categories of feeding relationships. Herbivores eat the tissue or internal fluids of living plants or algae, such as this zebra grazing on the grass. Predators kill and eat other organisms, which we refer to as their prey, such as this dragonfly larva that has caught a small stickleback. Parasites typically live in or on other organisms, its host, harming but typically not killing the host. This marine isopod is feeding on the tissue of a fish that it has attached itself to. Although these may seem clear-cut, sometimes the lines between categories do become blurred. For example, if a squirrel eats an acorn, the embryonic plant is killed. Is the squirrel an herbivore or a predator? Most would classify the squirrel as a predator because the seed contained a distinct genetic individual. Or consider a special type of insect known as a parasitoid. Parasitoids lay one or more eggs on or inside another insect. After the eggs hatch, the larvae remain with and consume the host, usually resulting in the host's death. This parasitoid wasp is laying an egg inside an aphid. After hatching, the larva will consume the aphid, undergo metamorphosis, and emerge as an adult, leaving behind a hole as it exits. While most of the examples we will be discussing fit nicely into one of these broad categories, it is important to appreciate that the natural world is much more difficult to classify. We are going to reserve our discussion of parasites for a later time, focusing for now on the relationships of herbivores and predators, beginning with how they obtain their food. Predation can be difficult when your prey don't stay in one place. If your prey are moving, you can employ one of two basic foraging strategies. Some predators, such as this red-tailed hawk or this cheetah, are quite mobile, moving throughout their habitat in search of prey. In other cases, the predator will remain in place and wait until the prey is either within striking distance or enters a trap. Because hunting, foraging, and yes, even waiting require an input of both time and energy, Predators try to maximize their return by concentrating efforts in areas where prey are most abundant. For example, the, the greater Yellowstone elk herd, which numbers over 200,000 individuals, migrates south every fall to a national refuge near Jackson Hole, Wyoming, returning then to Yellowstone every spring. Wolf and coyote packs follow these seasonal migrations, an energetic expense that proves to be worth the investment. Most predators will eat prey in relation to their availability, concentrating on whatever is most available and resulting in a relatively broad diet. Having a broad diet can be especially beneficial when prey availability frequently changes or is unpredictable. A study conducted in the 1970s by William Murdoch and others at the University of California studied the tendency of a predatory guppy to switch its prey choice. The guppies were given a mixture of two different prey, Drosophila, fruit flies, that were on the water surface, and tubificid worms that were on the bottom of the aquarium. By having the two prey options at different locations, Murdoch was able to ensure that prey were chosen and not just consumed by accident. They varied the ratio of flies to worms gradually over 12 days, transitioning from a 1 to 4 worm to fly ratio to a 4 to 1 worm to fly ratio. The x-axis in this graph represents the percentage of prey that are tubificid worms. In the first trials, when the pool of prey was 20% worm and 80% fly, the guppies focused their foraging on the flies, and the worms were only 10% of their diet. In other words, the flies were the most abundant, but note that the fish consumed them in a greater proportion than their abundance. The flies were 90% of the diet, but only 80% of the prey available. Soon after, when the prey pool consisted of 60% worms and 40% flies, the percentage of worms in the diet increased to almost 80%. In all cases throughout the study, the guppies ate disproportionate amounts of whichever prey was most abundant, 
switching their focus as relative abundance changed. So why would they do this? This type of switching may occur because the predator forms a search image of the most common prey type and learning enables it to become increasingly efficient at capturing the most common prey. This type of switching is consistent with predictions of optimal foraging theories. We should note, however, that not all predators have a broad diet. Some specialists will show a stronger preference for a specific prey than would be predicted based on the prey's abundance alone. For example, snowshoe hares may account for up to 80% of the diet of a lynx, even when the hares constitute only 20% of the available food. So while most predators have broad diets and concentrated their foraging efforts on whatever prey is most plentiful, a majority of herbivores have relatively narrow diets. In fact, while some large herbivores may eat all above ground parts, most herbivores specialize on particular parts of a plant, such as leaves, stems, or internal fluids. Leaves are most commonly eaten because they are abundant, available year-round in many places, and often the most nutritious part other than the seeds. While most herbivores feed on a narrow range of plants, most insect herbivores are very specialized, feeding on only one or a few plant species. For example, Agromyzid flies are leaf miners, which means that their larvae live inside a leaf, feeding on the leaf tissue, and usually leaving vis visible evidence of their feeding tunnel. Most agromyzid flies are extremely species-specific, as you can see here. The x-axis in this graph is number of plant species, while the y-axis is the number of fly species that eat that number of plant species. So, for example, just over 150 species feed on only one species of plant and will not lay their eggs on any other species. In fact, about 80% of the 300 species included here fed on five or fewer species of plant.